Coming to you at your leisure from Flatbush, Brooklyn, this is Nothing is Boring. As time goes on, I'm going to keep refining the elevator pitch, the, the explanation for what this show's about. So here's the latest version. Too much effort is put into accessibility, and the ends, being popularity or maximum audience in this case, are used to justify the means, which again, in this case, is rounding off the corners and making things easy to digest. This is an interview show where we talk to specialists, wonks, experts of all kinds, and try to get them talking the way they talk when no normal people are around. We try to get them to do that for as long as possible. The goal is the intellectual equivalent of language immersion. Just going to try to expose you and me to a whole bunch of novelty, a whole bunch of new concepts, a whole bunch of new ideas uh, in an effort to um, see if we can connect some new synapses in the brain. It's not an explainer. It's not a bio show. It's, it's not about creatives and how they work. It's just exclusively just trying to get really specialized people to give us a little bit of a window into how the mind works in, in all these uh, really kind of niche contexts. You're listening to episode three. If you missed episodes one and two, please go back and check them out. I'm really proud of them. This is episode three. I speak to Seki Chan. I spoke to Seki on a rainy day in late August uh, in her East Village apartment, which is like an all white gallery workspace, living space, kitchen on a fourth floor walk up, a space that she had renovated with her husband while they were living in the space, which if you saw it would blow your mind like it did mine. It's beautiful and it's spare and it Basically, is all white, save a, a rack full of samples from her brand, 7115, and also a kind of standoffish Shiba Inu. We don't talk about it in this interview, but Zeki was a pop singer in Hong Kong in her youth, but later she studied design technology at Parsons. I'm talking with her because she owns and designs for a, a low-volume, vertically integrated clothing company, and I wanted to know more about how that can even be done, especially on such a small scale, and especially while still being affordable. The garment business is the business of forecasting and selling the output of a technical art. It's industrial design, it's manufacturing, and in her case, retail and marketing all rolled into one when you're vertically integrated like that. So beyond having this special business model, Seki has a design philosophy that really resonates with me. She makes high quality, affordable, versatile pieces that, uh, in her words, work hard for the buyer. So this conversation ended up being a mix of technical details around the materials and the construction, as well as quite a bit about the flow of information up and down the chain from the retail customers to production and then back because the whole company are one unit that way. And so listening back on this conversation, I'm, I'm actually kind of surprised at how the answers that at first sounded kind of general are actually quite specific about the nature of the business and how things get done. If you want to connect with me at Hard Work Party on Instagram, on Twitter, hardwork.party is the website. At that website, you can find a little blog for this show with a lot of, load of images from this episode and from previous episodes. There's a form there where you can reach me. I would love to hear your feedback, positive or negative, constructive or otherwise. Let me know what you think and how I can improve this show. I internalize all that. I really appreciate all the feedback that I get. Tell a friend, please rate us five stars, subscribe on iTunes, tune in, Stitcher, Google Play, trying to get me on Spotify. Maybe if you know anybody there, drop a line, you know what I mean? And please enjoy the show. Stick around afterwards uh, for a little extra something, something. And thanks for listening. Seki Chat. Boutiques and designers come and go very quickly, 
and you've been in business for a while, and this, this is a dream for a lot of people, what you're doing, what do you think you might be doing differently than the people who don't succeed? I guess we, because I don't know the industry, so I just do it as I learn what is sensible to do, what makes sense, and I just kind of figure it out. And I also don't have, well, I guess if you categorize the industry as in fashion, I guess, I think that's when when it gets really tough because I think there's a lot of expectation and there's a lot of things that till today I still don't understood about fashion industry. I think that's it's a it consumes a lot within the industry more than the consumer. Like it, hmm. I guess if you kind of take that out of the contest and then run it like a normal business or like a retail business, then because our brand started like a retail shop, so I just always think about from a retail standpoint. Like um, when you say that, do you mean you started by stocking other brands' products? N- n- or you just started no. vertically integrated? Yeah, yeah, like so we we started with um, having a brick and mortar store. Mm-hmm. So I started by was well, selling things on the street first. Mm-hmm. So it's always been, you know, one on one. Like, mm-hmm. you know, how how I get a product and I sell it to you and how do I get margin and how do I make you feel better about paying me more money and then I get a better margin by making it things better but also cost less. That's kind of always what I'm fascinated by the idea of it. And then slowly I just become really invest into how to make things good. So then it sells well. That's just really the whole game. So what you're talking about really is efficiency, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That you... In a way. You have kind of engineered out a bunch of middlemen, right? What challenges come with taking on all those things under one roof? I think at the very beginning would be overhead. Yeah, startup cost, right? Yes. Um, Well, I would say... When I started, we, well, we never have like a big chunk of money to comes in to like, oh, here is how much you spend. We, see, here's the thing. I think the overhead, it's big, but also we don't have a lot of money to play with. So that's where the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's like, you have to constantly be making the money. That's why retail shop has become so important to us. We got the feedback and then we get to, we just need to be very reacting fast with like what every day even like there are days that there is like our earlier days that there's nobody buying anything a day Mm -hmm. but even somebody walking in and saying something about this thing then the next thing you would think about like what am I going to make this easier to sell tomorrow because I know the money needs to come in for me to pay the production because we trying to create our own production line versus outsourcing it Mm -hmm. so the overhead was it, at the beginning, it was always very hard because we had to pay a lot of people on staff. But at the same time, the demand wasn't always there. Mm-hmm. So it was, it's it's always trying to balance this out. Like, yeah. you know, you got to get the money in and pay the employee. And after a while, once you know how to do that, when everything's sort of like found its own place, then it becomes a lot easier. Do you produce in seasons or, or runs or do you break it up? Across the year, or are you just producing pieces at a time? Yes. Well, we do have vaguely a production schedule, like most clothing company. So we have fall, winter, spring, summer, yeah. pre-fall. But I think what we do differently is that even though we're doing trying to tackle a whole season, our minimum or our batches are really small. So then when things are being produced like right now we are wrapping up the fall winter because it's pretty much has to be out and selling in stores now and now we have some kind of like empty slots then we get to do home goods then now what do you we mean, can is that like empty floor space in retail is that what you mean no like the production so with like people that we're paying like our our studio people are still working in the studio mm-hmm. but now the production season it's pretty much 
over and done with because everything is already shipped out. Right? And you don't immediately start on the, the following season. It doesn't take no, you that long. Um, not really, because right now we just finished our spring summer. We're waiting for orders to come in and then our orders from our shop. We haven't started that season yet, but in between, there's always things like, you know, we're going to start making home goods mm-hmm. and which is going to, you're going to see in our shop. And, but also there's um, product. We also always have product that aren't seasonal. Like everything that I'm wearing right now, it's like, you know, simple trousers, simple things that like you can kind of put in the shop any time of the year. Right. And those are happen. We call the signature items, but also happens to be the best sellers in the shop across all our stockers, including our own shop. So those things now is a time to really focus on those as well. So it's my job. Part of my job is to make sure when we have a facility to make goods, it needs to be almost always working. Mm-hmm. And we cannot fall into the season of how the fashion industry goes. We need to kind of make it work that way. When you're deciding what pieces to put into production, mm-hmm. and let's say it's for one of your seasonal production runs, mm-hmm. how do you decide on what is going to get produced? Is it is it what you're excited about? Is it year over year you want to evolve? Are you following trends? No, I mean, like, we we have two collection every season, the signature collections. The signature collection usually don't change all that much, but it's just things that, like, I think, well, the idea of 715 is making something that people can use every day, that, har- that work hard for the person who are buying it, right? So, of course, the when we when we design anything, that usually it's the forefront of, you know, this jacket. It's a is it really going to be that useful? Like the person who bought it for like $250, how well is it going to serve her? How many years does she... We try not to follow trends so much. Um, but um, when I decided to put something in production, it's usually a combination of, you know, the retail team would talk about it and be like, hey, um, what do we think about this piece? It's this something that like our customer want and need but also because we also do wholesale too so a lot of times we look at what other buyers are reacting to a particular piece most of the time when we design something um after all the edits and we decided these are going to be in the collection i think we produce almost 96 percent of the things so you're not designing things that you're not putting into production very often no yeah and is that because you've gotten really good at knowing was there another time when you were designing? Oh, oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, all the time. There are things that like terrible, like that I don't like. <laughs> like it'd be like, ooh, what was I thinking about that mustard yellow? Yeah. <laughs> that mustard yellow, it's not very, it's not very timeless. <laughs> um, well, it seems like you're thinking very much about the value for the, for the mm-hmm. customer. And it seems like you've considered how there's a relationship between your company's embodiment, kind of your company's uh, structure and your story of being vertically integrated and how that value makes its way to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Is there value engineering that you're doing as part of the design process when it comes to materials Mm -hmm. or production? Have you ever designed something? Well, I I always think, yeah, like, Again, going back to my background, I always think that when I design something, it's 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 a lot more pragmatic to clothing than it is what other people think of clothing in my head. Like I always think about if I'm going to, you know, add a blazer to a to a collection, I think about oh, I mean there's so many blazers out there, why am I making this one blazer that it's going to be different? Like then I'll think about, you know, coming from why would a person need a blazer going out or going to work? Can we make both in one? Like, and how much should that cost? And then go through materials and even like, you know what, a blazer that would use all year round probably don't have lining on it because what about summer? Mm. Like there's like layers. So with that, like how do we make a blazer? It doesn't have lining on it, but it's like sturdy and it feels like lusterious that they can take it from day to night day after day then we think about the finishing like how do we achieve that finishing with no lining and you know it everything that 
we put the detail that we put in the clothes are are part of the design. It's not just about the the look and feel of it, but also like how it was being constructed and how much is it going to cost to construct and how much this you know cost a fabric and how long is it going to last the person and all these of course there's no you know algorithm like you plug it in and you know it's just all come from experience and feel like you the number one thing it would be to me the most valuable thing is understand your customer who they are like how are they going to justify like trying to get into their brain and if they who are they how do they usually justify a purchase and what is too much for them and and of course, myself too. It's intuitive at this point. But there's got to be a part of that process mm-hmm. where you bring a more technical uh, design mm-hmm. to production, mm-hmm. to a factory, mm-hmm. and they run the numbers and they say at the quantity that you can buy, this is your this is your price per piece, right? That's why we don't work with factory. Yeah. So we have our own production full time, or the, you're their full-time. only client. Yeah, I no, or you I, own it. I owned it. Holy yeah. Shit. So that's wait a minute. How did you start all of this at one time? No, it that's why it was really hot, and it was a lot of luck. It was incredible. So how how our studio started was um, the very first year that when we start doing this, we got into so much trouble because quality wasn't good, hmm. and then there's always a minimum. That's one thing about making things. It's there's always a minimum, Mm -hmm. which you cannot sell through. Um, But then with the minimum, the price is going to go down. But like, oh, if you make, uh, you know, you know, the drill, like, you know, 100 pieces, 300 pieces, then the price is going to go. But then even with that, like, I mean, I have one shop and I have, I just started. Like, how am I supposed to sell 100 pieces of the same thing? It's just not possible. And even though you decided, okay, I feel really strongly about this and then I'm going to make a hundred pieces of this, the quality isn't as good as what I think it should be. I mean, I'm coming from a background, like sort of like middle class. I feel like I was able to make a living, living in the Lower East Side, nothing I can afford. Like, Mm -hmm. I just think everything was so expensive. So, and the quality was bad. and, And I guess like when I was decided to like, oh, let's try to tackle this problem, I had in mind the quality needs to be super premium it has to be really good mm-hmm. like otherwise then wouldn't justify me making clothing like it's not that it's anything bad it's like i it, it wasn't my pa- passion to be a fashion designer it was some like i go into the industry feeling i'm gonna do it differently i'm gonna the the sole motivation is not about being a fashion designer it's about doing this and try to create something that beyond that. So I keep hitting walls and I feel like the stuff just wasn't something that I feel like this is really good and I cannot flip it inside out and show people all these nice things. I'm like, oh, these are okay. Like, I don't want to be just okay. Like, I want to be really good and a very attainable price. So, and then I speak to, you know, all the people that I know, my family, friends. And so my mom at the time, was my mom is just the sweetest lady she and then I tell her this problem and she's just telling to everyone and then she somehow met this person she is at the time she was the professor of Guangzhou University who um is the department head of the test down department mm, that's a good connection yes and then it doesn't get a lot better than that actually if you're looking for sourcing production yeah and then we were just talking about they had the same issue not the same issue they had an issue where People trying to find really quality job in China, Mm. graduates, Mm -hmm. where to find them. It's a good fit. Couldn't get a good job because everybody want things made cheap. And the talent that these people has go nowhere because nobody want to pay better wages. Nobody, they just want to keep doing their craft and do it in a way that makes sense to them because they're artists individually as well. So that's how... And at the time, um, Guangzhou City real estate wasn't so expensive. So we were able to rent and then we started a studio there. Start with the graduate there. And then we also, just by people, we start knowing people that, oh, she's a really, really good like seamstress. Like we should get her on the team. Whenever like we're like, oh, it looks like we, we are topping our capacity. Do you know any? It's just a network of talented people mm-hmm. like knowing that oh that studio 
want really good people and they pay mm-hmm. really well. The thing is, the more I learn about this is also what's so good about having your own facility is that whoever sew these garments, it's extremely important that person is always the same person. So then they know the standard, how fast they run the machine, how far they're going to, you know, cut the fab, the margin of the fab. Like all these things are just, you don't have to explain to them. They just know like mm-hmm. year after year, you just know what to expect. And then the next person is going to teach the person mm-hmm. after it. And that person after seven years, you just, it's like a family. It's like you trust them. Like this is, it, it makes it so easy at this point like easier than like what it used to be at at the beginning when I say the overheads was hard because these people are my responsibility I need to pay them they're on my payroll like I need to pay them even though I have no job you got a nut (laughs) so that's what I meant it's really hot but that's why making it the retail part needs to be strong so I'm in the shop all the time I need to like be able to communicate why these things are so good like what what I need to know who the customer is so then I can sell better. So then I can feed the team. Yes. Because, but then with that though, we don't have to worry about minimum. We don't wasting it anymore. We don't waste a hundred pieces of things that doesn't sell. What am I going to do with it? And then what happened is like people put them on sale and that takes away the integrity of any pieces that anybody would make. So it was a tough beginning, but I feel like because we really wanted to succeed, so I feel like everybody just brought it. Everyone was invested. Yeah, everybody was really invested. I feel like everybody who works on the retail team in New York also very invested into the idea of like, you know, having your own place to make things. It, it just feel really safe. Like when you have that, you just feel like you can really back it 100% because you know the person who are making it, who have been working for you for years yes and even the new york team and the you know the retail team and the you know the 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 production team hardly know or met each other we have such a strong bonding we just like oh my god like i always show them like oh look at the text that they you know it's Mm -hmm. really it's a it's a good feeling but you're getting feedback from customers and i do want to ask about that but i would also imagine that when you um, work with the production team that they tell you things about your garments that only they would know. What kind of things have you learned from them as the people that actually produce these garments? Have, have they ever told you something that in, informed the way you design the next one or, or yeah. change the design of a garment that you already have? Yeah, the, it, it really goes both ways. We get things, we got a lot of feedback from customers through the retail team and then we'll bring it back. Like now we're having a little bit of a zipper crisis here. A zipper crisis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then like, but then, and, and well, so then, this is coming from the customers in this case. Yes. Okay. And then, but of course, like lots of the time, honestly, they would always tell me like, you know, I learned most of, again, I don't come from a fashion apparel background. So a lot of the things I, most of my garment knowledge I actually learned from the team Mm -hmm. so I well as I go there I work with them and then they would just show me like they of course they would want to tell me why is it taking so long to make one garment and then because my job was always about like I need to know everything and then I'll be like oh this is taking a long time like why because oh because you know this is how you make the seam do you know we need to like cut this and then like we need to stitch it just like this like you know they would explain to me why these are important like why is it making it extra sturdy why do we need to bound every single seam inside why search line cannot be seen why are we making a v-neck the way that the v-neck is not a freaking seam right down the middle <laughs> like you know yeah. and and those things are you know the obvious one but then also there's many of them aren't so much and then I'm just learning all these from them and of course I would tell what I know and what I've learned and what I think is monumentally important to communicate to the customer to the staff over there but a lot of the times it's um it goes both ways the customer would tell something to our sales associate and then like they would feedback back to the production team like these zippers seems to having an issue and then they'll be like why because like we make sure this is really tightly on and like oh m- must be and then we just investigate 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 it takes three rounds like but we will get there it's a pretty interactive back and forth process and how much of uh how much of the, the production is is done on machines and how much is done by hand i mean most of most of the things is when you say machines like sewing machines yeah 
everything is done in everything sewing done machine. Done like there's no apps. I mean, who doesn't use sewing machine? Of course. But so I imagine there are things that you can only do by hand, right? Or can almost everything be done by a sewing machine? Are there materials you can't work with in a machine? Um, when different. you, yeah, when you are making, well, we are particularly proud with the couple of things that we do do that a lot of places don't do. It's reversible jackets. It's like one of the things that I wish I have one here to show. Oh, can I show you something? Of course. So that would be something that done all by hand. It's a jacket. Wow. They hate me for doing this to them. Whoa. The only this thing is, that goes is this through, wool? Yeah, this is oh, wool and wool. it's completely reversible. Oh man, that is cool. You can wear, I mean, I uh. ruined it pretty hard, but machine cannot go through this because machine cannot do this. You can't sew wool or what? With machine? Oh, machine to have it both ways wearable. This is completely 100% reversible. Yeah, where are the stitches? How does this work? Even every of these finishing stitches, it's by hand. <laughs> this by hand. Do you see the imper imperfection so, here? No. Like I mean, it's not as good as like a machine straight, but, yeah, but it's by hand. Wow. It's truly by hand. And these are how good are. And they make like 10 pieces only. 10 pieces and it takes four days. And <laughs> I'm sorry, what? It takes four like days. Like the make whole that? process would take, of course, they're not gonna sit there like four days strict to make this, but then not it would be. Not four man like, days. Yeah, yeah, it's like, but then it would be like, and the only thing that machine goes through is probably this zipper. Right. But look at, just look at the, the pockets. These are by hand, by hand, by hand, by hand. I don't even understand where the seams are. Uh, yeah, like it. It's just so wonderful. This this pocket goes to this pocket. So we're Same looking pocket. at a very clean jacket. Uh, it's a woman's jacket, as is so all nice. of Seki's stuff. And it has these, and I'll take some pictures of this. I gotta remember to take pictures of this. Yeah. Uh, it's totally so reversible. Nice. Like um, we were so proud of this zipper. piece. Um, the zipper, of course, works both ways too. That I mean, is an clearly. interesting design feature. So, but it, it just, but how good is it? it, it yeah, it's extremely clean it, and- Gray and navy, that's all you need. Yeah, it's- Like, I'll wear this any, you know, yeah. fall day. Yep. It's such, it, this piece is gonna stay in my wardrobe for years to come. Yep. Like I- So it, you, make, you, make, you make 10 of these, how many, how many do you make of any given product? Cause there's some- you have, Well, this particular, we have a very small run just because like it's super, super labor intensive and we were doing it mostly for the challenge for the team. I just, we always want to learn new things like sure. every season. So yeah. we also did a hand fluff piece. Um, we started to learn how to make like cool jacket. Yeah, that's These pretty boss. Our hand sealed. Like the the cotton in there, uh -huh. it's by oh, it's cotton. Yeah, it's cotton. Okay, so, so this a lot is of kind of like semi bubble when kind people of jacket. Yeah, so when people do puffy jacket, usually bigger company do. They probably would have the fabric done and have already coated, and then they yeah. But these are not like this is denim on the outside. The um, this is denim. Yeah, and then the inside is hundred percent cotton. We also don't use poly. The poly ones that you can buy the poly is great because it's warm, and most of the company we use poly and. Right. A lot of the puffy jackets, sometimes I get really surprised how warm they could get. But cotton, it just breathes really nicely. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's also very warm. That's what we wear in China. Like, and the denim's already cotton anyway. Yeah, exactly. This looks like a very Chinese garment. Both of these do yes. in style. Yes. Specifically yes. like Cantonese to me. Yeah. Well, this one in particular, very, um, very, very, it's a, I think that's what we grew up wearing yeah because we don't have like feather like you know down jacket right. right when we were like little yeah so we have you know people make jacket like how they would make blanket right yes so yeah that's basically it but both of them the collar style the lapel kind of dimensions yeah. to me have a have a this chinese one, blazer kind of look this one a little bit of a combination of a sumo japanese sumo mm -hmm. coat and um and Chinese. I saw I another cool sumo coat in your collection. Is that a theme you come back to? Um, yes. I mean, we just kind of, what well, this piece we really love because when we first run it, uh, it was for women. And then a lot of guys comes in and try it on with a big pocket. So this is actually a version that we were meant to have it for unisex. Okay. Do you have so, any other unisex stuff? Right now, just this one is something that we really keen on like want to explore and see how we're going to approach menswear or unisex wear. Are you, are you thinking about menswear? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it's something that I always think about, but I also just know, like, I need to take it one, one thing, thing at a time. time when I'm, and menswear is a whole other beast. And I feel like it's, I'd rather not do it than doing it wrong. Right. When it's, when it's out, it's going to be something that we all can be proud of. It seems like your philosophy would map to menswear just as well as it would for women. Yeah. Cause we were so much about like women uniform. Cause like, you know, men's wear uniform like all the time. Like, you know, you have the shirt, like, you know, five different color and that's probably what you wear. Yep. But I also kind of like to dress like that. Sure. And I also feel like, but that doesn't mean that you're just letting things go. Like I feel like there's gotta be a way that you can not spend a lot of time thinking about what you wear, but you still feel incredibly confident and attractive. Yeah. Like, like a woman would feel like sure. walking, you know, all the, you don't have to read the magazine to know what's the latest trend. You really don't have to like sit in front of your wardrobe for like, you know, 15 minutes to figure out what the top goes with the bottom. Yes. What if you just, you know, try to buy very little things like good things that, you know, you can count on day in and day out. And you don't think I don't, I, I hardly think before I get out the door, I don't even use that mirror. This is for my husband. <laughs> like functional I, and versatile pieces yeah yeah and i i wear everything to death and i want everybody to to feel to feel they can count on their clothes like it's not it shouldn't be something like you know comes and goes it's like you know you can use them use them like normal stuff you don't have to cherish them yes. like you know you cherish them when because you care about them but you you don't have to like oh no i'm gonna i'm gonna be very careful with this like oh, yeah. and i'm not gonna oh that doesn't look really good with those shoes what what about Maybe I should maybe I should use another top with mm-hmm. a different color. Mm-hmm. Like I, I don't think it should be like that. It should yeah, be you're lot. totally speaking my language. I would if you made men's clothes, I would be buying it. In, in and this is the impression that I get that this approach, especially in the neighborhood in which you're doing what you're doing, the two neighborhoods where you're you're selling at retail. Mm-hmm. I looked at your Yelp reviews, which are all people that have fallen in love not just with what you have on offer, but with the philosophy of what you're doing. And in a lot of cases, these are people that have spoken to you directly, but in a lot of cases, these are people that figured it out because it's evident um, from your product that you are producing things with love and with a philosophy of, you know, this is a functional item that is not uh, an expression of someone's ego. It's an expression of someone's dignity in a way, or someone's, uh, uh, philosophy um, and pride in in quality, mm-hmm. and I can see that in, in uh, your your there there are images going back, and your Yelp page goes back to like 2008, and people have, have thought that that's it when you opened. So nice. People yeah. have thought that about people were really nice. I was so beginning. shocked when people write things like that. I'm like people use Yelp for good reason. Like, I'm yeah. just like, <laughs> so, well, they don't complain. Not this complain is about like food. craziness. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll be like, yeah. Like it was, it was incredibly nice, but I think that was also another thing that we always want to achieve in the, the shop. It's, um, that wasn't one of the, uh, it wasn't one of the, the, the mission that we want to do, but we, after so many years, so many years being in the Lower East Side, you do feel being part of it. Mm-hmm. And more than ever, I feel um, we do want to keep that human connection where, you know, we opened a second shop in Brooklyn four years ago. That was when online was like starting to like really take shapes and like, but then I was just like, no, I actually want to open a shop. Double down on retail. Yeah. I yeah. really feel like that was what, that's what brought me here. Like, I feel like we were able to really get to communicate with the people. And then really the, the line was getting, I mean, in my eye, it, it gets better. It's really clearly, I wouldn't just be sitting here making better things if I don't get a chance to listen to what people say consistently, mm-hmm. like all the time. Mm-hmm. And I think that would be having a second location, not only that will bring our goods here in a different neighborhood, but also like we can hear more people what they what they think about these clothes. We yeah. probably would do better just by hearing what what another group of consumer get to try on these clothes and we get more first end 
data, if you will. Like yeah, online so you wouldn't get that. Not yeah, like you way. really don't. And then people write reviews differently online than they do yeah, in like, person. I don't. I don't know how it works online. Like I, I mean, of course we also have online sale too. Um, but we always trying to bring the same kind of care and it's not just like care for the customer, but also like the the connection, like uh, as much as we could from from an online sale. Like you know, if somebody sizing, just to be the most basic thing, sizing. How do we say in a in more of a human way? Like not just like okay, this measurement is this, this, and that. Like like how do we how do we at the little personal touch. How do you do that? Well, describe to them how does it fit. Yeah. Like, you know, this one's a little bit bigger, but if you're, you know, here is what I think. Like, right. we always, anybody who write us the email, like, ask about sizing, simple, simple question. We'll have follow-up question and we'll be like, oh, you know what, in, in my experience, because, like, everybody who are, like, writing you back those emails would be, probably had experience working on the floor as well. It's just like my experience with this garment would be this, this, and that. If you're somebody who are a little more curvy, I would, ex- I long form, like, you know, give them the whole, what you think. Um, if you're more curvy, like maybe like, I would probably go a size up on these because it does feel a little snug over the thighs, like, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, but if you are, you know, judging by your height, I will probably be, you might need to get it him, but you know what, I just, just really think about it as you're buying it. Yep. Like how you would talk to a customer sure. when they're in front of you. Not just a small, medium, large bucket. Yeah. yeah. Like, and it makes no sense. Size like one, two, three. So we tried to do that as much as we could, but we love, the team actually love, love being in the store and be able to like get to know our customer. And sometimes you people like them fit differently just because the job that they have. Like sometimes people like to fit make things tighter like fit tighter and which is totally understandable because of you know where where they from where where these thoughts come from why would this person want things to be so loose and again there's no right way or wrong way to fit anything so from california they probably want to lose yeah like or you know we don't know like we just want (laughs) to know who they are so then we know what is going to be the best best for them it's not just about making something and just give it to you yeah for money like right so which is much more of a high fashion approach, which is like, like this is what's happening this year and, and you, you need to catch up. Back to the production thing, there's a perception on, at least on Yelp, that you have a number of pieces on display at retail that are unique in the sense that there's only one. Is that true? Say again? There are a number of Yelp reviews mm-hmm. from people saying... Oh, be aware. Sample. If you see, oh, there's samples. Mm-hmm. So yeah. At the very beginning, we were like, we even need to like sell our samples on the floor um, because, you know, they're garments that we made and it just can't keep them around. Or yeah. you could, but you yeah. Know, and then, well, now we have, we have so much more of those. We cannot put them on the floor. Now we have like every two years and we'll put out like, you know, these Sample are samples. Sale. Yeah. Like a whole wall of them. Yeah. Every four months, there is a whole wall of them. And then clearly now we have retail calendar. We can't be putting samples out. But then when we were very, very small. You had to sell them. Yeah. How many, But how big is like a, is a normal production run of a garment for you? Oh, it's, it's very different. We could have things that, you know, 10 pieces. Yeah. Um, I always like 25. I always feel like if I don't feel confident selling something for 25 pieces then i feel like that's, that's your minimum kind of yeah like it's in my in my, in my head i'm like yeah. if i'm not confident selling something for like 25 pieces <laughs> yeah it's probably that's across not both worth... stores online with your wholesale oh product. yeah that okay. would be that 25 pieces was be distributing to that's still a pretty small run it's a very small run like, how many garments do you make in a in a season Wow, that's that's a math that I never do. <laughs> that's funny. And how big is your signature collection? Signature collection get bigger. Like signature collection, we do we we try to aim for like because like there's different colors, so the whole run we probably try to do like a hundred at a time, just because we don't want it to be not having the size, um, the yeah. right sizes. Yeah. That's why. Um, there are times that it's sold out and it's incredibly frustrating because I feel like a lot of people know of the signature because from someone, sure. oh, I needed these pants like yeah. tomorrow, like yeah, I mean yeah, for yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And then when there's no size, we try not to do that because one thing about having the signature collection, it's it also having the comfort of, I I think 
sometimes people do feel stressed out, like need that peace. That well, what if like they're gone? Like what if they? Right. Like I feel like it's something. The signature collection. It's a very, very, very uniform um, approach to right. Have you ever thought about spinning that off into a separate, or keeping that as seven one one five, and then doing another business that is much more fluid and changing, but having the signature collection just be like its own facility with its own team that's constantly making that and is handling more regularly, like that um, run. I don't think our business is that in that size and scale yet. Right, and you're growing though, right? Yeah, we are, but. You know, I don't think that it's going to add much to the shopping experience. Like, mm-hmm. it would but you're just talking about like, supply issues or like regularity issues, and I'm sure what you got to do from a pr- production standpoint is yep. clean the tables. Yep, and, set and then up this for is one what garden. we're going to do that. Do this now. Yeah, I think when well, I guess if if it comes to that, then we'll find another solution for it. I mean, I I don't. I'm pretty happy with because what happened is there are good season there's bad season and i think like having signature anytime that we can count on giving the work to the team to do a slotted into the time i think that creates a lot of stability to the business right now um but if we you know grow too fast and like started to separate things into their own facilities i think that to me just it's it's really far ahead from where we are today you have wool Mm -hmm. cotton many people mention silk online, a lot of natural materials, Mm -hmm. and even I've seen some knitwear. Are those materials more difficult to work with than synthetics? Is knitwear difficult to work with? Because I look at knitwear and it looks like chain mail to me, and I'm thinking like, how? No. For um, somebody that doesn't know anything about knitwear, is it? I think most materials are pretty, it's, well, silk usually are what I think is the hardest. Right. What's hard about silk? Because they're slimy. Right. Like, can you sew it with a machine? Doesn't it just tear into a million pieces? No, but fright? that's why the person needs to have steady, good hand. Yeah. Like every, when they, that's the speed of running the thing and how they take care, handle the fabric. Mm-hmm. Like their hand has to be completely, I mean, you do a sand wash silk. Anything that like has a sweaty feel to it, your hands need to be extremely clean. And also just know like your hand needs to be delicate. Like, you know, you, you would always constantly thinking, how many stitches is going an inch? Like you're you're thinking about the speed, but then of course they don't think about it because they're they're so good already. Like that's why it's important to have your own routine. Thing. It's just a feel. Yeah, I would be scared to mix silk things, but call me paranoid. Personally, Apparently, yeah, like yeah. I would be nervous too if I one day would have to outsource something like and in mm. to mix small batch. Yeah, I would not trust. It's a hard thing to do if you're making a thousand or many thousands of something with very delicate material, it's much, it, it would look really good. Like, like imagine you're buying something nice from like what theory or Vins or whatever that it's known to be good quality and mass produce. Their factory would be having, you know, 50 people sitting down that way. And then each person is doing one thing, sewing that one line. Production and line. then you go, yeah, yeah, you go. And then, so that person, so that like to profession. Yes. And that's why it's hard to do it in a small batch because the person that who are in our studio was sold as pieces from the start to build the entire garment, build an itself. entire garment, yeah. but still keeping the consistency of small little steps. And so I think silk, it's always a really hard thing to, to do. And I, I would not be surprised. They would screw up a couple <laughs> like in the batch, which yeah. it's totally understandable. But after, if they're trained well, they, everything should be kind of like the same. Right. Like it wouldn't be like, oh, silk is definitely particularly harder, but I don't think it's harder than syn- synthetic. I think it's it, it's equivalently hard. If you're going to found something that replaced silk, it would be either poly or satin or it's, there's also had the slimy the quality slime. <laughs> anyway. So it's really, it's the same thing. So what do you like about silk? I don't wear a lot of silk. No, I, but you do have silk in your collection. I, I do. Right? I, yeah. when, when there's, like things that I feel like it needed to be a little more dressier things. Um, but silk is a great material. It keeps you warm in the winter mm. and it keep it breathes really well in the summer. It's mm-hmm. a great material all year round. I, I don't use it as much now. I still use it for like if I'm making a dress that it's meant for 
evening or meant for cocktail or you know something that people can really dress up and down then right. i still use silk because there's a certain appeal to it that it cannot be replaced by other but i wouldn't you know put silk on everything <laughs> now just because like i sweat through it and i yeah. it just it's not attractive and it, <laughs> and it's also like you know taking care of it i think more than ever i feel like we have garnered customer that really started to wear our clothes like their everyday uniform yeah and having things on the del- more delicate side of things, I think it, it makes people doesn't want to do that. Yes. Like, I, I don't want people to feel like, oh, this is silk. I need to be really careful with right. it. Right. Like, because like, if I get it dirty, I need to get it dry clean. You yes. know, I want them to not to think about that. Yeah. So Knitwear. Yeah. Back to knitwear. I'm picturing, so it's sorcery to me when I see somebody sitting down with needles, sewing needles and a ball of yarn. And then like after three weeks, a hat comes out or a sweater or something. And I'm assuming, no? That, no, what? like we are, knitwear is not hand knit. And well, okay, but there's a machine, right? Yeah, that's like yeah, interlocking yeah, yeah. the yarn. Yep. Does it make, it, you can't cut it, right? No, you make panels, so. How does this work? Because it seems to me like if you, if you were to make knit garments, like you, like if you take a, a roll of cotton and you cut a pattern out of it and then you no, just sew it together, it's fine. You knit, you, you knit panel of it and then you up knit them. Well, so you, um, uh, uh, <laughs> I must have, oh, here. There's a lot of visual examples in this show. I'm gonna have to take pictures for you guys. Sweater. Just like, you know, simple okay, sweater. We're looking at a they, you know, turtleneck sweater. They, they knit Cable this knit. part to here. She's and then sleeve and from then. Scene to scene. How to connect, like, this yeah. is easier. How to connect this part to this part, they call up knit. So... What would be a seam in a garment that's made out of a fabric is a up knit. Well, this, there's no fabric here. Right, exactly. They, they, yeah. they, they would knit up whatever that need to be happening here. So is that just a different name different, for what's a seam? There's in, different... Yeah, so this is a seam. It's like a joint. It's like welding. Yeah, wow. exactly. With... With, with, you what know, a trip. so it's, it's, so they, they, they all do this separately. You know, yeah. when you, when you see your grandma making, it's the same thing. They yeah. don't knit from, from here down to here. They knit this part and they so, knit that part. But when you're knitting this, one of these panels, is this machine insanely complicated? Like how do yeah, you explain they need to, the machine? Is it I computerized? Mean, I, mm-hmm. Oh yep. my God. Yep. How did they do that before computers? I don't know. Is it a loom? Like, I, I don't understand I mean, that's why it's, it must be really expensive. Like, you Goodness know, before gracious. that. Like, now, sweater still I mean, are expensive. Yeah, handed sweater, it's extremely expensive. I mean, even like some person, it's like yeah. knitting it. Like, I mean, this clearly is not. It's made by a machine. It's yeah. a very regular looking cable knit yep, exactly. uh, pattern. And so when you're preparing a file uh, or, or a cut sheet or whatever it is that, that drives the machine that makes this panel is it cad how do you how do you create a file how does that so for me i do everything in illustrator okay and then the knit guy he would know like how knit operator with the gauge that we wanted to yeah it's a very specific thing like where like i would not know like just like how i would not be able to make pattern from scratch was there a time that like like, a knit guy came onto your team and you were like sweet we can do knits now or like yeah like of course like we andy is amazing I would just have illustration drawing with all those measurements and you know how I would like this to lay and flat everything flat and right. then he would figure out oh you want to use this gauge like which is how thick the yarn that I want to use right and then he will figure out how many stitches need to go into to make this happen yes. I mean knit is definitely one of the things that I do feel like I'm pretty weak at like I definitely need a lot of help on other than like making knowing the style this is how i would want it a lot of people making this happen yeah what other materials or are there materials that you don't feel like you could work with now that you want to learn what you need to know to get there like i don't know leather or like outerwear stuff that's more technical waterproof anything oh i was i guess like waterproof stuff is quite interesting like ring coat i think it's something that like People don't always have in their wardrobe, I, but I always think that Not a, a, cool a one. good one, yeah, a good yeah. one would probably be useful. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it's something that people 
are ready to invest in because it's not like we're living in a place where like rings all the time. If I'm, you know, back in the days when we're in, when I was in boarding school in UK, like everybody get a trench coat. Right. Like it's like a thing. Like, yeah. but then here is not really much the like Northwest, that. The Northwest, Seattle and Vancouver. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Colorado, like, outerwear, big People deal. would need it like, yeah. you know, ring coat. That it's something that I found interesting. I think ring coat is actually really beautiful, but it might be something that, but getting the right material, I think also like, just to, you know, every time when we want to do something like very new, like the puffy jacket, it takes a lot from the team. It's like we need to set aside two weeks R&D. not to do things yes. and to do learn something new. I think that it's something that, you know, we I want to be really sure before we set aside time to like, you know, actually explore how to develop these type of things. Right. Um, material wise, I don't think there's anything um, that we... But recently, we learned how to make down coat, which is like a big deal for us. Yeah. Learn how to do fill down by hand. Yeah, is it a hand. mess? Does it just go everywhere? Yeah. yeah. Well, so we actually f- flew a couple of our teammates to Hon Zhao, which is a different part of China, to learn that and to, you know, teach how the rest of the team to do it. Is so that, that where most really cool. of the serious down stuff goes on? Or did you just Over have a connection there? there? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I think, like, Huangzhou is a place where people do a lot of outerwear, which I I don't know, but I, I have never been. But, like, clearly, it's it's what um, Chertlum, which is our director, is like, oh, they make the best outerwear there. Like, let's just go and learn that. And they're willing to teach? They they, they, they have a good connection. See, yeah. here's the thing about people don't know about China, I think. Or for that matter, anywhere, community. Like if people want to make, make nice things, there's a, it's like. Untapped pride. Yes. yes. There is, there is something like that. People want to, I know how to make that. Sure. And then you never know. Maybe one day we'll work together with that team too. Like, you know, it'd be like, oh, something that we don't, don't know how to make. Maybe you guys can help us. And then we can outsource certain things that we really want to make, but we haven't get to that point yeah, but yeah. I feel like there is something that people, which I feel like lucky to know how to do this in China because yeah. I'm Chinese. And there are many people that are very proud of their craft and they just really not giving a place or a voice to to those talents. That and sounds like a huge untapped potential. Yeah. I mean, you, I do know that also that it, it, there's a perception that like lower end inexpensive things are made in China, but, yeah. but most people don't realize that all the high end stuff is also made in China. Exactly. Like, and then those, and then I mean, a lot sometimes of the in the time, same facility, then why, turn yeah, it up and turn it down. To be honest, like how, why do you think all this knockoff come from China? Because right. people are people. so good. Yes. Yeah. Same people like they're, they're it's um, so that's what makes, I think that what makes the studio of 715 is so we're doing something all on our, it's a brand, it's a, it's a, it's a brand on its own. Um, we were able to garner like a group of very talented, dedicated people that stay on the job for so long and, and, and feel very proud doing the thing. Like we're not selling like, you know, thousand dollar coat, but that's not what we want, but we want to make nice things. Yeah. We want to, you know, it's, it's, It's quite beautiful. That's it. Seki Chan. Wasn't that lovely? That was lovely. Ah, I got so many more questions that I should have asked. I'm going to have to ask either Seki in a follow-up interview or or someone else in that biz about... You can see I'm kind of obsessed with materials and, and, and how they come together. I got, I got so many questions about all the, the fabric things that I don't understand and about the machines that make them. Uh, I mean, if you couldn't tell from that interview, sewing machines themselves are just a complete mystery to me. I've never operated one. Uh, but I found that fascinating. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As always, I'm going to hit you with a little bit of Wikipedia Arcana. This is a Wikipedia entry that kind of shattered my mind. This one's actually a sub-entry under hypothermia, and it's the entry for paradoxical undressing. I'll try to keep them topical related to the episode. So 20 to 50% of hypothermia deaths are associated with paradoxical undressing. It's right there in the name. This typically occurs during moderate and severe hypothermia. As the person becomes disoriented, confused, and combative, they may begin discarding their clothing, which in turn increases the rate of heat loss. 
paradoxical because why would you get undressed uh, as you're freezing to death? So rescuers who are trained in mountain survival techniques are taught to expect this. However, people who die from hypothermia in urban environments are sometimes incorrectly assumed to have been subjected to sexual assault. One explanation for the effect is a cold-induced malfunction of the hypothalamus, part of the brain that regulates body temperature. Another explanation is the muscles contracting peripheral blood vessels become exhausted, known as a loss of vasomotor tone, and relax, leading to a sudden surge of blood and heat to the extremities, causing the person to feel overheated. And then in their final act, to shed their clothing and freeze to death. What a strange malfunction. I hope you enjoyed that. Please rate us five stars on iTunes. Tell a friend at Hard Work Party on Twitter and Instagram. Hardwork.party is the website. I'm contractually obligated to say that our theme music is by the great Breakmaster Cylinder. I'm not obligated, but nonetheless elect to say that Breakmaster Cylinder is objectively tremendous. He also does all the music for the show, not just the theme. Please tune in next week when I talk with Jake Rosenthal, co-owner of a brand new club here in Brooklyn called Elsewhere that was built from the ground up. It's a crazy story of how that came together. Formerly owner of a, of a really beloved DIY music venue called Glasslands Gallery, RIP Glasslands, and co-owner of Pop Gun Presents, which is an indie music promotion company here in New York that has made a name for itself by booking acts just before they pop, sometimes so close to when they pop that they have to move the venue after booking the show. So we get into some of that. It's a fascinating interview. Join us next week. You know I love you. 